today bi idhnillahi tabarak wa ta'ala we are going to continue with the discussion that was started last night to preface the talks for today the lectures for today that are entitled al fiqh fi din understanding one's religion or al ilm al sharri sabab wiqayati min al fitan it is a cause or it is a'dham al asbab lil wiqayati min al fitan it is the greatest cause of protection from fitna and there are many texts in the book of allah and the sunnah of the nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that demonstrate this reality from them is a statement of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he said ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu stajibu lillahi wa lir rasul idha da'akum lima yuhyikum oh you who believe respond to the call of allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when they invite you to that which will give you life that which will give you life meaning it will cause you to live a good life in this world and in the hereafter wa alamu anna allaha yahulu bayna al-mar'i wa qalbihi wa annahu ilayhi tuhsharun and know that Allah comes between a man and his heart and that indeed we will be gathered every human being will be gathered in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he said وَاتَّقُوا فِتْنَةً لَا تُصِيبَنَّ الَّذِينَ ظَرَمُوا مِنْكُمْ خَاصَّةً وَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ شَدِيدُ الْعِقَابِ Naeem, I don't know if you can hear that in the office. We sound like we're in a gymnasium. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala He said, وَاتَّقُوا فِتْنَةً لَا تُصِيبَنَّ الَّذِينَ ظَرَمُوا مِنْكُمْ خَاصَةً وَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ شَدِيدُ الْعِقَابِ And fear a fitna وَاتَّقُوا فِتْنَةً لَا تُصِيبَنَّ الَّذِينَ ظَرَمُوا مِنْكُمْ خَاصَةً and fear a fitna Imam Ahmed rahimahullah ta'ala he said al fitna huna al shirk he said what is meant by fitna here is a shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala meaning that on account of a person not responding to the call of Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by learning religious knowledge and implementing religious knowledge and ordering the good and forbidding the evil and doing everything that is required as regards that knowledge that the result of that will be fitna لا تصيبان الذين ظرموا منكم خاصة and fitna here and it is a تحذير from Allah سبحانه وتعالى and it is said نكرة تهويرا لشأنها and it is said to be a fitna وأيما فتنة and what a horrible fitna meaning beyond what you can imagine and it is undefined the amount of fitna and it is a tremendous fitna beyond what you can imagine that will not strike those that are wrong from amongst you in particular meaning that it will afflict all of the people as is come in the statement hadith reported by Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu that is authentic authenticated by Shaykh al-Bani rahimahullah ta'ala in his writings in which Abu Bakr al-Siddiq he said innakum taqra'una hadhihi al-ayah indeed you people you read this verse and you don't understand its meaning and you don't understand its meaning the statement of Allah when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he said Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu alaykum anfusakum O you who believe worry about yourselves La yadurrukum an dhali idha ahtadaytum Yani those that La yadurrukum an dhali idha ahtadaytum Yani those that are astray cannot harm you so long as you are rightly guided so long as you are rightly guided and then Abu Bakr al-Siddiq he said quoting from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said إِذَا رَأَى قَوْمٌ مُنْكَرَى that if a people see an evil فَلَا يُغَيِّرُونَهُ and they do not change it meaning with their hands and that which is in their ability يُشِكُ أَنْ يَعُمُّهُمُ اللَّهُ بِعِقَابٍ مِنْ if they see a munkar in one narration, يَسْتَتِعُونَ تَغْيِرَهُ فَلَا يُغَيِّرُونَ And they have the ability to change and they don't change it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala يُشِكُ أَنْ يَعُمَّهُمُ اللَّهُ بِعِقَابٍ مِنْهُ 
and it will soon come to pass that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will afflict them all with a punishment from himself subhanahu wa ta'ala so without a doubt people concealing knowledge concerning the truth concealing the or preventing the ordering of the good and forbidding the evil or holding back from advising for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without a doubt it is from the greatest of causes of destruction and fitna so I was stated by the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as comes in the hadith of Abdullah or rather comes in the hadith of Anas ibn Malik reported in Kitab al-Atisam in Sahih al-Bukhari the book of holding fast of the Sunnah but they came to him complaining about Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al-Thaqafi and he was a man who had killed many of the Muslims and even some of the scholars and the righteous they came to Anas ibn Malik complaining about Al-Hajjaj and Anas ibn Malik he said مَا مِنْ عَامٍ إِلَّا وَالَّذِي بَعْدَهُ شَرٌ مِنْهُ حَتَّى تَلْقَ رَبَّكُمْ سَمِعْتُ هَذَا مِنْ نَبِيِّكُمْ So there is not a year that will pass except that the one that comes after it will be worse than it up until you meet your Lord. I heard that from your Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. Abdullah ibn Nas'ud he said مَا مِنْ يَوْمٍ إِلَّا وَالَّذِي بَعْدَهُ شَرٌ مِنْهُ That there is not a day that passes except that the one that comes after it will be worse than it up until you meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they asked him about that. He said, لا أقول رخاء خير من رخاء أو أمير خير من أمير أو شر من أمير. He said, I don't say that what this means is that there will be some times that are more prosperous financially than others. Or there will be some rulers that will be better and more just and so on and so forth than others. ولكن علماءكم وفقهاءكم يذهبون. But what it means is that your scholars and your jurists, your learned ones from amongst you will understand their religion are going to die. Your scholars and your learned ones are going to die and then they will not find anyone who will replace them. Meaning that there will be more Muslims, and there will be more problems, and there will be more tests, and there will be less knowledge of how to deal with those things. And so with a lack of knowledge comes an increase in fitna. And with an increase in knowledge comes a decrease in fitna. This is why we have seen over the years that our Mashaykh have said to us, and I remember Sheikh Ahmed al-Najmi said to us more than a decade ago, he said that he could tell the level of the knowledge of a community based upon the questions that they ask. Based upon the questions that they ask. Meaning that with religious knowledge, people will know the answers to many of their questions. They won't have to ask, they already know what Allah has obligated as far as the rights of one another, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden as far as business transactions, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden as far as sins and transgression and other sorts of affairs. And so when people ask questions about things that, is, that are mandatory for them to know, that demonstrates that they are negligent in seeking beneficial knowledge. It demonstrates that they are negligent in seeking beneficial knowledge. And so this subject matter, which is the knowledge of the religion, is a guarantee of protection from fitna. It's from the most important of things for a person to understand. And it is from the Sunan Allah al kawniyah It's from the ways of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with His creation. That the more they have of knowledge, beneficial knowledge, the more protected they are from fitna. A Shaykh Sa'adi rahimullah ta'ala, he has a tremendous poem that is called Al Manduma fil Qawaid al Fiqhiyya, a poem about fiqh principles. And principles in fiqh are very important for a person to learn. And the scholars, they mention five and some mention six principles in fiqh that all of fiqh go back to. They make it easy for a person to understand the religion in general. In his poem, he mentioned the importance of beneficial knowledge before mentioning the principles of fiqh. And he said that the vabits of al-ilm al-nafi, beneficial knowledge, 
is al ilm alladhi yadra'u an sahibihi al shubuhat wa shahawat it is the knowledge that wards off from a person and protects a person from al shubuhat wa shahawat from doubts as regards their religion and shahawat and improper desires as regards their religion what is meant by al shubuhat and shahawat the ulama they say is that al shubuhat wa shahawat are the source of every fitna. Al fitna to fitna tan. As Ibn Qayyim he mentions in the book Iratat al Ahfan, and many of the scholars before him and after him mention that there are two types of fitna. As we find likewise in the tremendous book about the virtue of the Ghuraba and of the strangers by Al Imam Ibn Rajab al Hanbali rahimullah ta'ala that the strangers, the Ghuraba, the safe sect, the victorious group, are those that are safe from Ash-Shubuhat and Ash-Shahawat. They are safe from doubts and they are safe from desires. And the scholars, some of them, they say that what is more dangerous of the two is which is more dangerous? Doubts or desires? Doubts. Why? Why? lack of knowledge be more why is it more dangerous than desires huh so if a person has a doubt in the religion and what is meant generally by doubts are and he doubts that lead people to innovations where people think that something is part of the religion that is not a part of the religion right as a shubha and a shubha and in the Arabic language, it comes from the word shibhun. And yani that which is a resemblance, where the truth resembles falsehood, or the falsehood resembles truth. Where a person thinks that something that is true is untrue. Yeah. Right? They have a doubt as regards the meaning of something in the religion. They think that it doesn't mean what it obviously means. Or they think that something that is not a part of the religion is meant by the text of the religion. Or is a part of the religion because somebody that is marmuqun ma'ahum yani somebody that is respectable and honorable with them holds a certain viewpoint so they say well they must have got that understanding from their study of the religion and these sorts of things so if a person practices a doubt in the religion and he makes it a part of their religion that's very harmful because and he has the salat they said that the sahib al bid'ah mazdadu min Allah illa bu'dan and the harder he tries he gets farther away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the greater effort that he gives, he gets farther from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is doing something that he doesn't, and he's not going to repent from because he thinks that he's doing something righteous. Right? And the harder he tries, the farther he gets from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some of the scholars, they did mention that a shahawat can be more dangerous from another aspect. A shahawat can be dangerous from another aspect. And as much as a shahawat, a person's desires and lust, is where a person knows the truth and intentionally opposes it because it is in contradiction to some type of wealth or some type of status or some type of leadership. And it can be more dangerous from the aspect of a person, for example, a person of innovation. They can be an, an innovator, can innovate with good intentions or with bad intentions. If he has good intentions, if he has good intentions, then he thinks something is, he has a misunderstanding, ta'wil and batil, a misinterpretation of the text, and he's something that he pulled out of thin air, and he understood something, and he has a salaf salih, they used to say, as was stated by Al-Hasan al basri and others, inna min al-ujmati utiyitum, that you were, misled, you were misled because of your inability to fully understand the Arabic language, these sorts of affairs, somebody just going on there, we can understanding a perception of the text, right? And it doesn't give a person a license to innovate, a license to do what he has done, because this person is not permissible for him to even deal with the text in that manner, where he is and he putting his own spin and his own construction upon things while he is not qualified to do so. The person who is doing that is fabricating a lie upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unknowingly. 
Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymi rahimahullah ta'ala on the other hand he said that the person as this was mentioned likewise in the book Haqiqatul Kadib the reality of al-Kadib the reality of lying by a Shaykh al-Allama Abdul Rahman al-Mu'allimi rahimahullah ta'ala from the scholars of Yemen he mentioned the statement of the scholars and he said that there is an ijma' of the ulama that the person yakdibu ala Allah yaftari al-kadib ala Allahi amidan wa ya'lamu annahu kadib wa yaz'umu annahu min al-shara' fahada murtaddun an deen al-islam that the person who knowingly ascribes a lie to the religion knowing that it is not a part of the religion but they introduce it as something that is from the religion while knowing that it is not from the religion they are an apostate from Islam and so the person of innovation who knows that what he is upon is dalala but he still calls to it and he is still upon it because he wants wealth or because he wants leadership or because he wants position or because he doesn't want to be humiliated in front of people and these sorts of affairs then he has opposed the text because of his shahawats because of his desires and he is from those people that are maghdubun alayhim as opposed to the other people who are dhalin and he is from those that the anger of Allah is upon as opposed to those who are from the dhalin and because the maghdubun alayhim and are those that they know the truth yet they oppose the truth and war against the truth knowingly and the dhalin are those who are jahil and those that are ignorant and they act upon ignorance and they act upon ignorance and so the ulama they say that the way that a person protects himself from the two types of fitna which are shubuhat and shahawat is by having al-ilm al-shari by having knowledge of the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so you're going to continue from the words of a shaykh, an Imam Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala from the book Igathat al Ahfan. And yesterday we explained that what he is reading here or what he is quoting here are the words of an Imam Shaykh al Islam Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala from the book Al Qa'idah fil Mahabbah. Al Qa'idah fil Mahabbah that is from that is collected with the collection of any short books of Ibn Taymiyyah that are called Jami al Rasail wal Masail. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimullah ta'ala, as Ibn Qayyim rahimullah ta'ala explains, that Ibn Taymiyyah explains that everything that a person does, they do out of their love of that thing. And every religion that a person practices, every belief that a person holds, Every action that a person performs, they do it to acquire some type of benefit for their self, and they love benefit for their self, or to protect their self from some type of harm, and they love to be protected from harm, according to their perception, according to their perception. There is nothing that does what it does except because in its perception, it will bring about some type of benefit for itself by doing that thing, or ward off some type of harm from itself by avoiding that thing. And he explained that all of the fitan that occur in the dunya, they occur either because a person has an improper and correct, or an improper and corrupt rather, understanding of his religion or practice of his religion, or the fitna that occurs in the dunya, it occurs by a person trying to get the dunya in a way that is wicked and evil. And he is so. He said if a person is trying to get some type of benefit or be repelled from some type of harm, then the thing that they are doing in any particular affair is either something they believe to be a part of their religion or they don't believe to be a part of their religion. Meaning they believe it to be a part of their religion, they have a corrupt understanding of their religion, or they don't believe it to be a part of their religion, it is some pursuit of the dunya, they think that they can get something worldly of benefit or be protected from, from harm by skipping past the laws of the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he said, well, total bliss and happiness in this world and in the hereafter 
It comes about by following the religion of truth. It comes about by following the religion of truth and knowledge and implementation. It comes about by following the religion of truth and knowledge and implementation. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He informed in a number of places in is in his a number of places in his book. As we mentioned yesterday, that in the book of Allah, guidance is coupled with mercy. And misguidance is coupled with a shaqa, a shaqawa, and with misery. He said, and some of the people they have the perception that the believer that the happiness for the believer is only in the hereafter that the happiness for the believer is only in the hereafter and that so long as the believer is in this world that he will be defeated and he will be humiliated and he will be lowly as a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the kuffar and the munafiqun and the fajara and the dhalama and the disbelievers and the munafiqun and the people of sin and wickedness and oppression and so on and so forth always have the upper hand and there is no portion of authority or strength or happiness any full happiness for the believer so long as he is in this world and he mentioned that there are people who when they are tested by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they see how people are tested by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That if they believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a wisdom for what he does, then they will say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has tested the believers to raise their status in the hereafter and to provide their reward in full without account in the hereafter. But as for being successful in the dunya, and now being afflicted in the dunya that this is something that is not for them and if they do not believe in the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as is the belief of the Asha'ira that Allah doesn't have ilal doesn't have reasons for what he does the Asha'ira they say because al-ilal are ahdaf and they are goals and objectives and Allah is not in need of having any goals or objectives and in this way they negate the meaning of the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees what he decrees in the qadr for the maslaha of mankind, for the benefit of mankind. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that everything that he does, that jami'u af'alillah tadurhu bayna ar-rahmati wal-adl. As the ulama mentioned, that all of the actions of Allah is a belief of Ahl al-Sunnah, they revolve between being the mercy of Allah and justice from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nothing that occurs in the universe escapes from being the mercy of Allah or the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that everything Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed to occur is khair. It is good for mankind. It is something that mankind can benefit from. Everything that Allah has decreed to occur is for the greater good of mankind. And this is from the kindness and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Asha'ira, they don't believe that. And when they see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has tested the creation and has tested the righteous from amongst them, they say, Allah fi mulkihi ma yasha wa yahkumu ma yurid. That Allah does as He wills in His universe and He judges with what He so determines subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is just how it is. La yus'alu amma yaf'alu wa hum yus'alun. He will not be asked about what He does, but rather the creation will be asked about what they do. And we can ask why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does what he does and we can't think even about why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does what he does and so they go through this world not believing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sunanun kawniya has ways that he deals with the creation and that there are, that, that there are asbab that are murtabita bil musababat yani that the, at the cause and effect that there are ends and means that are connected together and that if a person takes the proper means they will lead to the most praiseworthy of outcomes if they take the proper means the legislative means they will lead the person to the most praiseworthy of outcomes that will be in the favor of a person in this world and the hereafter and he said that every person when they find themselves tested by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when they find themselves tested by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they have mubahathat and iradat and ishkalat and ajwiba they have different things that trouble them. 
يعني, and confuse them as to why they are being tested and different answers that they give according to the situation of a person and according to their portion of al ma'rifah billah wa asma'ihi wa sifatihi wa hikmatihi wal jahli bi dhalik and the way that they deal with the test that Allah gives them is according to their understanding of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala his attributes his actions or the ignorance of those affairs or the ignorance of those of those affairs فالقلوب تغلي بما فيها كالقدور إذا استجمعت غليانا and so the hearts boil over and spill out their contents like a pot that boils over and spills over its contents meaning that you will see what is inside of a person's heart when they are tested and the contents of their heart spill out until their statements and in their actions and he mentioned the way of Jahim ibn Safwan and the Mubtari'ah when Jahim ibn Safwan took some of his students to the Jathma and Ahl al-Balah and he to the diseased people, the lepers and the people who were being afflicted with sickness and so on and so forth and Jahim ibn Safwan he said to his students he said انظروا أرحم الراحمين يفعلوا مثل هذا he said look could the one who was the most merciful do something like this? Could the one who was the most merciful do something like this? And he said, in li rahmatihi. Ibn Qayyim, he said, he said this rejecting the mercy of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Kama ankara hikmatah. As Jahim al Safwan rejected the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Falaysa Allahu anda jahim wa atba'ihi hakeeman wala rahima. He said that Allah in the view of Jahim al Safwan the kafir zindiq and the kafir heretic and the view of Jahim and his father Jahim and Safwan and his father was Allah was not wise and nor was he merciful yes yeah, so need be careful of questioning the wisdom of Allah the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you are being tested when you see the creation being tested and he said that some others said and this is a statement of Abu Talib and Makki from the people who was viewed to be from the Imams of the Sufis. He said, Ma ala al khalqi adharru min al khaliq. That there is none that is more harmful to the creation than the Creator. There is none that is more harmful to the creation than the Creator. Wa kana ba'dhuhum yatamathal. And some of them, they used to recite the following lines of poetry. Ida kana hadha fi'lahu li muhibbihi. Fa madha turahu fi aadihi yasna'u. That if this is how Allah treats those who love Him, then how do you think He would treat those who hate Him? How do you think He would treat His enemies? He said, وَأَنْتَ تُشَاهِدُ كَثِيرًا مِنَ النَّاسِ إِذَا أَصَابُهُ نَوْعٌ مِنَ الْبَلَاءِ يَقُولُ تُرَعْ مَا كَانَ ذَنْبِ هَتَ فَعَلْتَ بِهَادَ And you see some of those, when they are afflicted with some type of calamity or hardship, a Muslim may mistreat them, you find some people, they say they are passe from Islam because they don't like how the Muslims treated them. He said, we don't know where you grew up, Jack. <laughs> but the last time I checked, any of the Kufa is the most mannerable of people either. Right? And anything that is wrong with the Muslims, you're going to find that the Kufa have that problem to an even higher degree by far. Right? You find a sister will say that she apostated because her husband mistreated her. A brother will say that he apostated because he didn't like the character of the Muslims. And at the end of the day, I mean, when you look at the reality of the affair, I mean, the Iman had never settled into their heart. They were just looking for a reason. They were just looking for a reason. He says some people, when they are hit with an affliction, they say, I mean, what do you think I could have possibly have done that you would have done this to me, O oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What could I have possibly have done that you would have done this to me? We covered this with the brothers yesterday, but many of you weren't here. He said, I'm more than one person, Ibn Qayyim, he says, said to me, إِذَا تُبْتُ إِلَيْهِ وَأَنَبْتُ وَعَمَلْتُ صَالِحًا ذَيَّقَ عَلَيَّ رِزْقِي That I find that when I have repented and turned back to obedience to Allah and have done righteous deeds, that Allah makes my wealth and my sustenance tight and constricts my situation and my affairs. وَنَكَّدَ عَلَيَّ مَعِيشَتِي and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes my life difficult in general. وَإِذَا رَاجَعْتُ مَعْصِيَتَهِ 
And when I go back to disobeying him, that I find that my wealth comes back to me. And that I am I find help and in my affairs, I need to conduct my affairs and, and he have comfort in my life and so on and so forth. He said, هذه الأقوال والظنون الكاذبة الحائدة عن الصواب مبنية على مقدمتين. This is what we are getting back into today. Masha'Allah. He said that these statements that people say when they question the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that demonstrate that they are ignorant about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they don't have the knowledge that they need to protect themselves from being harmed when they are tested by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the topic, right? knowledge of the religion is a protection from fitna. It shows a person how to deal with calamity and hardship and so on and so forth. He said these statements that people make and these false assumptions and thoughts that people have about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that drive them away from what is correct of behavior and belief and so on and so forth are built upon two affairs. The first is that a person has husnu dhan bi nafsihi wa deenihi? Is that a person who questions the mercy of Allah, the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That they have good thoughts about themselves, that they overestimate their practice of the religion. They overestimate their practice of the religion. And they believe that they are doing everything that is mandatory upon them and staying away from everything that is forbidden from them. And the second thing that it is built upon is the belief of many Muslims that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not aid the people of truth and support the people of truth in the dunya. But that is only for them in the hereafter. But that is only for them in the hereafter. Rif'atu wal izzah wal hifthu wal ta'yeed. And he being raised by Allah, being honored by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, being made to be loved and respected and the hearts of the creation by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being strengthened by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and supported by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this is not something that comes for the believers in this world but it is something they have to wait to the hereafter to see so these are the two things that this erroneous belief is built upon He said, and these two affairs, these two premises, they are built upon a person's ignorance of their religion. They are ignorant of two things in their religion. The first, they are ignorant of the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of what Allah has obligated upon them. And the second, they are ignorant of the promise of Allah and the threat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are ignorant of the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they are ignorant of the wa'ad of Allah and his wa'id the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his threat he said for indeed the worshipper of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala إِذَا اَعْتَقَدَ أَنَّهُ قَائِمٌ بِالدِّينَ الْحَقِ if he believes that he, has, that he has established the religion of truth in full فَقَدْ اَعْتَقَدَ أَنَّهُ قَدْ قَامَ بِفِعْلِ الْمَأْمُورِ بَاطِنًا وَظَاهِرًا then he believes that he has established what he has been ordered to establish inwardly and outwardly. وَالتَّرْكِ الْمَحْذُورِ بَاطِنًا وَظَاهِرًا So the next time you're tested, the next time your engine blows up, the next time your transmission goes out, the next time your wife freaks out, and the next time any something of difficulty strikes you in the dunya, and you say that I'm practicing my religion, any better than I've been practicing my religion and I'm still being tested and so on and so forth ask yourself how many things that Allah has ordered you to do inwardly and hourly have you abandoned and how many things that Allah has forbidden you from doing inwardly and hourly are you still doing and we mentioned yesterday from the words of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Utaymi rahimullah ta'ala that Many people as regards the affairs of the heart, those things that are obligated of the heart, they are negligent as though they are not even a part of the religion. And there are things that are forbidden any from the affairs of the heart that are ashaddu tahriman, 
that are greater in prohibition than the forbidden acts of the limbs. That are greater in prohibition than the forbidden acts of the limbs. Like kibr, like al-hasad, like al-hiqdu wa dhagha'in, like al-shamatatu, like the affair of arrogance or jealousy or holding a grudge against your fellow Muslim or a person having and he gloating over the misfortune of another Muslim Ibn Qayyim Ta'ala Madaraj Salikin he said all of these affairs are greater in prohibition and more harmful to the person than drinking khamr and committing adultery and fornication these, are, these affairs are major sins of the heart destructive sins of the heart most of what we mentioned, the ulama, they call them al-dhunuba shaytaniya. They call them the satanic sins. Because they are from the behavior of shaytan. They are that a person behaves like a devil and has a heart like the heart of a devil. Harboring malice and animosity towards the Muslims. And a person having jealousy and spite and holding grudges. A person gloating over the misfortune of others, loving to see his brother fail, loving to see her sister fail, these sorts of affairs, these are satanic affairs. Loving khilaf, as it was stated by Abu Sulaiman al Khatabi, Kitab al Uzla, he said that you will find the majority of people in the world that we live in today, Yuhibun al Khilaf wal Fitna. They love differing in fitna and controversy. They love differing in fitna and controversy. It's something that we have to be very careful of living in the Western world, especially living in America. And that there is a, that there is a, a culture of loving controversy and spreading controversy and so on and so forth. That things, any that it's not right unless it's wrong. And a person doesn't feel comfortable unless there's something negative to talk about. This is how people are. People love controversy. People love to create controversy if there is no controversy. Abu Sulaiman al-Khattabi rahimullah ta'ala he said about the, about the reality of the majority of people he said that the behavior of most people is as such that they act like the most meritorious of affairs and afdal al-umur an la yuwafiq ahadan ara ra'ihi is that they don't agree with the viewpoint of any other person to the point that even if you compromised your viewpoint to agree with them they would change their mind just to still oppose you he said, فَمِثْلُ هَذَا لَا يَعْتَقِدُ الْحَقَّ دِينًا He said, the likes of this person, he will never take the haqq as his religion. Because he just wants to be in opposition to people. وَلَا يُؤَيِّدُ وَلَا يَنْصُرُ الْحَقْ And this person will never support or aid the truth, but rather he is always supporting and aiding himself and his opinion. And so if a person of the truth oppose, opposes him, and you see that people are like that. That people are like that. If they are opposed, if they have a personal problem, if a Salafi owes them money, or if a Salafi speaks in a particular way to them, so I don't deal with you jokers. They start going over, sitting with the tabligis, saying that they have such good character. You miss a point? You miss a part where they lie on Allah and His Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Why? Because they and they share their food with you or they're like this or they're like that or they smile in, the, in your face and they make a mudahana and they compromise in their religion and mujamala and they flatter people and that's good character and that's good character right so you find some people are like that yuhibun al khilaf or shar they love controversy they love opposing people they and they look for controversy so the point is that there are many things that people do as regards their religion that they don't even realize that they're doing. When a person is being tested, they are being tested either because they have done something that Allah has forbidden them from doing or they have left off something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered them to do. Or they have left off something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered them to do or they have left off patience as regards implementing the orders of Allah and staying away from the prohibitions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Ibn Qayyim he said فَسُبْحَانَ كَمْ صَدَّتْ هَذِهِ الْفِتْنَةُ الْكَثِيرَ مِنَ الْخَلْقِ بَلْ أَكْثَرُهُمْ عَنَ الْقِيَامِ بِحَقِيقَةِ الدِّينِ 
He says, Subhanallah, how many people have been prevented because of this fitna of not understanding the reality of the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what is incumbent upon them and mandatory upon them as regards the duties of their religion and not understanding the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the threat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that those who, be, that, that those who act in obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they will get happiness in this world and the hereafter and bliss in this world and the hereafter and be protected from harm in this world and the hereafter and those that disobey him subhanahu wa ta'ala they will be in a state of misery they will be in jaheem fi dunya wal barzakhi wal akhira they will be in hell and earth and hell in their graves and in hell on the day of judgment it's the reality of the affair it is the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and dealing with his creation so Ibn Qayyim rahimullah ta'ala he brings some very lengthy speech by Shaykh al-Islam Ibn al-Taymi rahimullah ta'ala that we cannot possibly cover the entirety of in this sitting and afterwards he says وَالتَّمَامُ الْكَلَامُ فِي هَذَا الْمَقَامِ الْعَظِيمِ يَتَبَيَّنُ بِأُصُولِ نَافِعَةٍ جَامِعَةٍ that to complete the discussion as regards this tremendous aspect of the religion that the person will get happiness by acting upon the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and staying away from the prohibitions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he said then to complete the discussion as regards this tremendous aspect of the religion يَتَبَيَّنُ بِأُصُولِ نَافِعَةٍ جَامِعَةٍ and he, then it will become clearer, it will become abundantly clear by knowing about a number of comprehensive beneficial fundamental principles so he gives 11 principles as regards the test of the believers the test of the people of the sunnah the test of those that are following the sabil al mu'minin the path of the believers which is the path of the salaf al salih those who are aspiring to be upon the way of the salaf and when they are tested in this world 11 principles that they should understand 11 principles that they should understand al aslu al awwal the first principle and ma yusibu al mu'minin min al shurur wal mihan wal adha duna ma yusibu al kuffar the first thing and this is something that you must understand and your children must understand and your wives must understand and you must use it to advise your brothers when they are being tested by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he said the first affair is that what the believers encounter of harm and test and abuse in this world is much less than what the kuffar are afflicted with it is much less than what the kuffar are afflicted with and the reality of the affair bears witness in favor of that and the reality and of the world in which we live in is a witness for that وَكَذَلِكَ مَا يُصِيبُ الْأَبْرَارِ فِي هَذِهِ الدُّنْيَا دُونَ مَا يُصِيبُ الْكُفَارِ وَالْفُسَاقَ وَالظَّلَمَةَ بِكَثِيرِ Likewise, what the righteous are tested with in this world is less than what the wicked and sinful and oppressive people are tested with in this world by far. As the first principle. As the first principle. الأصل الثاني the second principle أن لا يصيب المؤمنين في الله تعالى مقرون بالرضا والاحتساب that which the believers are tested with by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it is coupled with الرضا being pleased with the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala والاحتساب and seeking the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala فإن فاتهم الرضا فَمَعَوَّلُهُمْ عَلَى الصَّبْرِ وَالْاَحْتِسَابِ And if they are incapable of being pleased with the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then they are to resort to being patient with the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while seeking the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What that means is that الصَّبْرُ حَبْصُ النَّفْسِ عَنَ تَصَخُّتْ بِالْمَقْدُورِ is that patience 
is that a person prevents their self is that a person prevents their self from being displeased with what Allah has decreed that a person fights with their self they struggle with their self as regards being displeased with what Allah has decreed what الرضا is a higher level which is that they are pleased with what Allah has decreed they are pleased with what Allah has decreed and the ulama they say and there's a level that is higher than that which is being grateful being grateful with what Allah has tested you with he said this is something Ibn Qayyim he mentioned in his book about patience and gratitude he said this is something that usually only happens much later that a person has the foresight to look back as something that they were tested with some time ago and actually be grateful that Allah tested them with that thing but patience is what is required and it is that which occurs as soon as the thing strikes as soon as the thing strikes it is possible that later a person will be able to be pleased with the decree of Allah but what is mandatory at that time is to be patient to be patient with the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which is that they hold their self back from being displeased that they hold their self back from being upset they're hurting they're in pain and if they're uncomfortable it's difficult for them they fight with their self as regards being upset with the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is less than being pleased with the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while seeking the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he said this is the reality of the affair for the believer the reality of the affair for the believer is that he is pleased with the decree of Allah while seeking reward of Allah or he has at least patient he has at least patient with the decree of Allah while seeking the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and by doing so the heaviness of the affliction will be lightened for them they have a rada or they have a sabr and that makes it easier for them to deal with what they are being tested with فَإِنَّهُمْ كُلَّمَا شَاهَدُوا الْعِوَضِ هَانَ عَلَيْهِمْ تَحَمُّلَ الْمَشَّاقِ وَالْبَلَاءِ he said and so every time they can see the عِوَضِ every time they can see that there is going to be some compensation for what they are doing that they are going to be compensated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said وَمَا عُطِيَ أَحَدٌ أَعْطَاءً أَوْ خَيْرًا وَلَا أَوْسَعْ مِنَ الصَّبْرِ that no one has been given anything by Allah that is more vast and better than patience that is more vast and better than patience so a person is leaving off something what is he leaving off when he is patient what is he leaving off a tasakhut displeasure right he's leaving off a tasakhut being displeased with the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so if he leaves something for Allah then Allah will give him what is better than it there is going to be a iwad. Awadahu lahu khayran min. Allah is going to give him a iwad. There's going to be a replacement. In place of the thing that Allah has taken from him or has withheld from him, there is going to be a replacement. And he knows that this is the way of Allah and dealing with his creation so long as they are at least patient. So long as they are at least patient. And if they can be the next level, which is to be pleased with the decree of Allah, there is going to be even more of a replacement and a reward and if they are at the next level there is going to be even more of a replacement and even more more of a reward he said and so the more they observe and realize that there is going to be an iwad that there is going to be some type of compensation something that they are going to get in replacement for what was taken or what was withheld by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hana alayhim tahammul al-mashaqi wal it becomes easier for them to deal with and to bear the difficulty and the hardship of what they are being tested with. He said, and the kufar don't have either of these things. They don't have a rida and they don't have a lihtisab. They don't have 
contentment with the decree of Allah, being pleased with the decree of Allah, and they don't seek the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what they are doing. So what is left? What's the third thing? Patience. He said, Wa in sabiru. He said, and if they are patient, فَكَصَبْرَ الْبَهَائِمْ Then it is like the patience of an animal. It is like the patience of an animal. وَقَدْ نَبَّحَ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَانَ عَنَ ذَلِكَ A donkey can be patient. A dog can be patient. A khinzir can be patient. Right? And so patience without expecting a reward from Allah, without ihtisab, is like the patience of an animal. It was like the patience of an animal. He said, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has drawn our attention to this. In verse number 104 of Surah An-Nisa, when Allah said, hakima." Allah said, and do not become weak in pursuing your opponent. And Pursuing your enemy upon the battlefield. He said, In takunu ta'alamun, if you are feeling pain, then they are likewise feeling pain just as you are feeling pain. If you are hurting, they're hurting just like you're hurting. And there is no human being on the face of the earth that is spared from a ta'allum. And from feeling some type of pain or difficulty. Right? And this is Dar al Imtihan. It is the world of being tested. Where the khubatha, where the people of filth and the tayyibin and the people who are pure intermingle and as a result of their intermingling Allah said we have made some of you as a test for others so won't you be patient and indeed your Lord sees everything no one is safe from being tested no one is safe from feeling pain if you are feeling pain then they are likewise feeling pain if you are hurting they're hurting just like you're hurting وَتَرْجُونَ مِنَ اللَّهِ مَا لَا يَرْجُونَ But you can hope for from Allah what they can never hope for. You have to hope for from Allah what they can never hope for. They don't have any reward coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If they die, if they lose their property, if they get sick, if it's, like, if, it's, if it's like that, they don't get anything at the end. They don't get anything at the end. While you can expect an ibad, you can expect something to be replaced by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَاشْتَرَكُوا فِي الْأَلَمْ وَامْتَازَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ بِرَجَاءِ الْأَجْرِ وَالظُّلْفَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى And so all of mankind share in feeling pain and hurting. While the believers stand out and are distinguished by being able to hope for the reward of Allah and gaining nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the second principle. Al-Aslu Thalith, the third principle. And Al-Mu'min إِذَا عُوذِيَ فِي اللَّهِ فَإِنَّهُ مَحْمُولٌ عَنْهُ بِحَسَبِ طَاعَتِهِ وَإِخْلَاسِهِ وَوُجُودُ حَقَائِقِ الْإِيمَانِ فِي قَلْبِهِ وَوُجُودِ حَقَائِقِ الْإِيمَانِ فِي قَلْبِهِ حَتَّى يُحْمَلَ عَنْهُ مِنَ الْأَذَى مَا لَوْ كَانَ شَيْءٌ مِنْهُ عَلَى غَيْرِهِ لَعَجَزَ عَنْ حَمْلِهِ The third thing is that the more the believer is harmed for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or abused for the sake of Allah or mistreated for the sake of Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala The more he is made to be able to bear What he is tested with To the point that If The believer Who is obedient to Allah And sincere to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala And has the existence of the reality of faith in his heart That makes it possible for him to bear these tests That if some of what Was placed upon him of mistreatment or harm was placed upon somebody else, la ajaza an hamlihi. They will be totally incapable of bearing what the believer can bear. They will be totally incapable of bearing what the believer can bear. Meaning that the more a person has a faith, the more Allah makes them and prepares them to be able to deal with adversity and hardship in this world. وَهَذَا مِنْ دَفْعِ اللَّهِ عَنْ عَبْدِهِ الْمُؤْمِنِ فَإِنَّهُ يَدْفَعُ عَنْهُ كَثِيرًا مِنَ الْبَلَاءِ He said, and this is from Allah's protection and defense of His believing servant. For verily Allah repels an abundance of affliction from His believing worshippers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He repels 
an abundance of affliction from his believing worshippers. And whatever is unavoidable for them to go through of affliction that Allah has not warded off for, from them. Then Allah has repelled away from them the heaviness of those things. Those things that Allah has not totally averted from them. Then Allah has averted from them the heaviness and the hardship and the difficulty of dealing with and bearing those things according to their level of faith. Al Aslu Rabi' the fourth of the eleven principles. Ibn Qayyim Rahimullah Ta'ala he said, An al Mahabata Kullama Tamatkanat fil Kalb wa Rasa Khat Fihi Kana Adal Muhib Fi Rada Mahbubihi Mustahlan Gaira Maskhut. He said that once the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the love of the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the religion of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and al-mahabba in general includes all of these things. Once al-mahabba, once love has taken control of the heart of a person and is deeply planted in his heart, Meaning once the, once the love of Allah, the love of the Prophet wasallam, the love of the religion, the love of the believers takes control of his heart and is deeply rooted in his heart. كَانَ أَذَا الْمُحِبْ فِي رُضَى مَحْبُوبِهِ مُسْتَحْلًا غَيْرَ مَسْخُوتِ He said that when the person is mistreated and abused for the sake of of the one that they love. He said the more they are mistreated and abused for the sake of the one that they love, seeking the pleasure of the one that they love, occurs, and he, it is mustahlan ghayra maskhut. And he's, when they are tested and mistreated in this way, then it is something that is sweet to them. It is sweet to them. And it has a beautiful taste to them. And some halawa. There is a sweetness to it, and it is something that is غير مسخوت. And it is something that they are not displeased with. They are not upset about when they are tested for the sake of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Ibn Qayyim rahimullah Taala he mentions an example of this in his tremendous book Madariz Salikin. He said that when a person is mistreated by the kufar or mistreated by the munafiqun, and so on and so forth for practicing their religion. He said that they understand, and Ibn Qayyim, he said this in, this in the discussion of the aqabat, yani the barriers on the sirat al-mustaqeem. And he said that there are obstacles that a person needs to get past that are, that prevent people from moving forward on the sirat al-mustaqeem. And after he mentioned seven or eight barriers, Ibn Qayyim rahimullah ta'ala, he said, and there is something that is unavoidable for every person who walks upon the path. And he, if a person gets past a shirk and kufr, if a person can get past and be spared from innovation, if a person can be spared from major and minor sins, if a person can be spared from wasting their time, if a person can be spared from fudul and mubahat, and he from overindulging in what is permissible, and he, those things that prevent him from moving forward on the path like he needs, he mentions those affairs, he said there is one thing that he can never get past, which is the abuse and the mistreatment of those that are off of the path or those that are upon the path. He said, and he needs to know the muraghamatul shaitan. That <coughs> aggravating the shaitan, upsetting the shaitan is something loved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The believer, when he sees that the kufar enraged, the kufar upset that he is practicing something from his religion, that brings a certain sweetness to his heart. Oh, you hate it. Let me do more of it. <laughs> Right? He said that this is the reality of the affair. That the more a person has of the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his heart, the more that this love has taken control of his heart and has penetrated into his heart, the more he finds that when he is abused and mistreated while seeking the pleasure of the one that he loves subhanahu wa ta'ala, that it is mustahla ghayr maskhut. It is something that is sweet. It is something that is enjoyable to him, and it is not something that upsets him. And the 
and the people who love one another are known to boast to one another about this affair when they are mistreated when they are mistreated and they're defending someone that they love and he, when they come across the person who was mistreated and he, the person that they were defending they were mistreated for defending a person or having love for another person or so on and so forth he said this is how people are amongst one another so how much more for the connection of the servant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala فَمَا ظَنُّوا بِمَحَبَّةِ الْمَحْبُوبِ لَا he says so how much more do you think should be the case of loving the one subhanahu wa ta'ala who was the most high الَّذِي إِبْتِلَأُهُ لِحَبِيبِهِ رَحْمَةٌ مِنْهُ لَهُ وَإِحْسَانٌ إِلَيْهِ The one that when he tests his servant, that it is mercy from him subhanahu wa ta'ala and kindness to his servant. الْأَصْلُ الْخَامِسِ The fifth affair. أَنْ مَا يُصِيبُ الْكَافِرْ وَالْفَاجِرْ وَالْمُنَافِقْ مِنَ الْعِزِّ وَالنَّصْرِ وَالْجَاهِ دُونَ مَا يَحْصُلُ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ بِكَثِيرٍ Is that whatever type of honor or victory or status that is gotten by whatever type of victory or honor or status or honor or these sorts of affairs that is gotten by the wicked or the disbelievers that it is much less than that which is gotten by the believers anything that they receive of status or honor or so on and so forth in this world is much less than what the believers receive but the reality of the affair is that it is a humiliation for them and that it is a means to break them and it is degradation for them. And you find that those people that are respected amongst the kuffar, but they're not really respected in the reality of the affair. And that any type of honor that they have is really something that Allah has given them to break them. Allah has given it to them to break them. This comes in hadith of Uqbat ibn Amr that the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said when you see Allah giving his servant something of the dunya what they, that they love while they are disobeying Allah then it is Allah leading the person to his destruction. Is a person being led to his destruction. He said the reality of the affair the inner aspect of the affair of them being honored hourly or raised hourly or having status hourly is dhullun wa kasrun wa hawan is that they are really being humiliated and degraded and broken. Even if hourly it is contrary to that. Even if hourly the affair is contrary to that. He said, Qala al Hassan al Basri rahimullah ta'ana. Al Hassan al Basri said, Innahum wa in hamla jad bihim al bighalu wa taqtaqat bihim al ni'al. إِنَّ ظُلَّ الْمَعْصِيَ لَفِي قُرُوبِهِمْ أَبَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا أَنْ يُظِلَّ مَنْ عَصَاهُ He said, no matter how beautiful the riding animals are made to be, and no matter how, no matter how fancy their footwear is made to look, indeed the ظُلَّ of الْمَعْصِيَ Indeed the humiliation of disobedience is in their hearts. أَبَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا أَنْ يُظِلَّ مَنْ عَصَاهُ And Allah has refused except to humiliate those who disobey Him. Al Asl Sadis, the sixth affair, and a betila al Mu'min, Kaddawa ilah, Yustakhraju minhu, Yastakhraju minhu al Adwa al Lati lo Baki at Fihi Ahlakat. He said, The sixth affair is that the test that the believer goes through is like a cure for him, that removes the sicknesses that are within him, that would destroy him were they to remain within him. أو نقصت ثوابه، or that would lessen his reward with Allah سبحانه وتعالى in the hereafter. وأنزل درجته، or that would cause his درجة his level in the hereafter to become lower. فيستخرج البتلاء والامتحان والامتحان منه تلك الأدواء. and so the test that he goes through and the hardship that he goes through. And the affliction that he goes through, they pull out, they remove these illnesses from him. And he is made to, and he goes to al-istidad, he is prepared because of 
these tests that he goes through to receive his reward in full and to arrive at his level in full with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hereafter. And it is known that this is better for the believer that this happens. It is better for the believer that, that it happens and were it not to have happened. As the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said, وَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِهِ لَا يَقْضِيَ اللَّهُ لِلْمُؤْمِنِ قَضَاءٍ إِلَّا كَانَ خَيْرًا لَهُ That I swear by the one in whose hand is my soul, that Allah does not decree any affair for the believer, except that it is better for him. وَلَيْسَ ذَلِكَ إِلَّا لِلْمُؤْمِنِ And that is not for anyone except for the believer. إِنْ أَصَابَتُهُ سَرَّاءٌ شَكَرْ لَكَانَ خَيْرًا لَهُ If he is, if he encounters that which is pleasing, and he easy for him, then he is grateful and that is better for him. And if he encounters that which is harmful for him, then he is patient and that is better for him. He said this test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is from the perfection of Allah aiding the believer and honoring the believer and giving afiyah to the believer and sparing him from a greater affliction. وَلِهَذَا كَانَ أَشَدَّ النَّاسِ بَلَاءً الْأَنْبِيَاءِ And for this reason, then the reality of the affairs as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, that the greatest of people in being tested are the anbiya. ثُمَّ الْأَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِمْ فَالْأَقْرَبُ And then those, are, then those that are closest to being like them, and those, then those that are next to them in nearness to their way. يُبْتَلَ الْمَرْءُ عَلَى حَسَبِ دِينِهِ a person is tested according to the level of their religion. فَإِنْ كَانَ فِي دِينِهِ صَلَابَةٌ شُدِّدَ عَلَيْهِ الْبَلَى If a person has some hardness and firmness in his religion, then the test is made severe for him. وَإِنْ كَانَ فِي دِينِهِ رَقَّةٌ خُفِّفَ عَنْهُ And if he has some lightness and weakness in his practice of his religion, it will be lightened for him. وَلَا يَزَالُ الْبَلَاءُ بِالْمُؤْمِنِ حَتَّى يَمْشِي عَلَى وَجْهِ الْأَرْضِ وَمَا عَلَيْهِ خَطِيئَةٌ and the believer is not, does not cease being tested until he walks upon the face of the earth without having a single sin remaining upon him. Al-Aslu Sabi' The seventh affair And ma yusibu al-mu'min fi hadihi al-dar min idalati aduwihi alayhi wa ghalabatihi lah wa adahu lahu fi ba'd al-ahyan amrun lazimun la budda minh He said the seventh affair is that what the believer goes through in this world of having any idalati aduwihi alayhi and he having the tables turned upon him having the roles reversed where the believer has the kuffar over him and he is under the kuffar or he has the people of wickedness upon him while he is upon obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala idalatu aduwihi alayhi yani the enemy of the kafir, the, the enemy of the believer being placed upon him or over him or having some type of authority upon him or defeating him or his mistreating him as sometimes it is something that is binding and is unescapable, it is unavoidable and must occur he said and he looks at it to be just like severe heat or severe cold. If he was to go outside and complain about the weather until he was purple in the face, it wouldn't change anything. Right? You see some people, they think the way to change a difficult situation where you have an oppressive ruler over you or you have a kafir ruler over you or you have any some type of any people of oppression or wickedness over you is to go out into the streets and the protest to hold signs and to hold placards and banners and saying heck no we won't go no justice no peace we're gonna burn this such and such down right a peaceful protest right throwing molotov cocktails and flipping police cars over right and he <laughs> it's a peaceful protest though right it's a peaceful protest so they go out and they think that the way to change something is by a tasakhut, yani by expressing their displeasure. This is how we're going to make a change. 
We're going to holler and scream and carry on and so on and so forth until somebody changes their mind about something that's making them a lot of money. Yeah, right. <laughs> and they say, you know, we just have way too much property and way too much assets and, you know, we just it's such a disparity in the wealth. We understand now. We didn't know, right, until you showed up and you started to pick it and so on and so forth. You put the pressure on us, right? The joke is in the Bahamas. A satellite phone. He don't care what you're doing in front of his building, right? Okay, we changed our minds now, right? Some people think, think that the way to deal with those affairs, I need to complain and to carry out so on and so forth. And he's a believer. He understands that if he has somebody of oppression that has been placed above him by Allah as a test, that this is something that is unavoidable that the believers go through. The Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, after the death of his wife and after the death of Abu Talib, after the death of his wife, radiallahu anha, and after the death of Abu Talib, he left to go to Ta'if. And he couldn't return to Al Medina illa fi jiwar al Mut'am ibn Adi. He had to return to Mecca, rather. He couldn't return to Mecca except under the jiwar, the guarantee of protection of a kafir. He had to find a kafir to guarantee his protection after Abu Talib died to return back to the city. After he had tried to give da'wah to the people of Taif. And they returned him back in his hills and sent the Majaneen and the Subyan out into the streets to throw stones at him until blood filled his sandals. Alayhi salatu was salam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he didn't say, okay, let's go back, get our placards up. <laughs> do a peaceful protest, so on and so forth. Let's complain about what happened. Let's go back and say, it's not right how they did us. As a matter of fact, what happened? The Prophet Sallallahu was turned out of Ta'if. What happened? Who came to him? The angel Jibril, who was with him? The angel of the mountain. I have with me the angel of the mountain. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala said that if you so wanted O Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I would destroy them between Al-Akhshabain, between the two mountains on both sides of Taif, they Allah would have caused the mountains to fall upon them. Allah has given you the choice of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, Bal. He said, but rather, I desire that Allah and Yastakhrij Allahu mean aslabihim. But I hope that Allah will bring forth from their aslab, and he from their backs, meaning from their progeny, a people who worship Allah and will make shirk with Allah. Who is the tribe of Taif? Who knows? Banu Tamim. Banu Tamim. How many scholars came from Banu Tamim? How many scholars came from Banu Tamim? Banu Tamim is an enormous tribe. Many of the modern day scholars came from Banu Tamim. Many of the ulama of the Da'wat al Najdiya, al Salafiya, from the Da'wah of Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab came from those people. Allahu Akbar. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He said, I hope that Allah will bring about, will bring about a people, bring forth a people that worship Him and won't make shaykh with Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so the believer, He looks at those affairs of Idalatul Adu alayhi, and He of having an enemy placed upon Him being in a situation where he has a lower hand and the kufar have an upper hand above him or the munafiqun or the people of bidah have an upper hand above him to be something lazimun labudda minh it is something that is unavoidable no matter what he does there is nothing that he can do about the affair kal harr shadid wal bard shadid if Allah is testing him with that he looks at it to be like the severe heat or the severe cold wal amradi wal humumi wal khumum and like illnesses or sadness or grief. It is something Amrul Lazim Dar. That is just how people yani, are made to go through things in this world. Yani, this is the reality of the situation of people in this world. Even children go through hardship in this world. Even animals go through hardship in this world. According to what has been dictated by the wisdom of the one who was the most wise of the wise, subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَلَوْ تَجَرَّدَ الْخَيْرُ فِي هَذَا الْعَالَمْ عَنَ الشَّرِّ وَنَفْعُ عَنَ الْذُرِّ وَلَذَّةُ عَنَ الْأَلَمْ لَكَانَ ذَلِكَ عَالَمًا غَيْرَ هَذَا He said, if 
There was only good in this world and no evil. Only benefit in this world and no harm. Only pleasure in this world and no pain. He said that would be another world besides the one that we live in. And that will be a creation other than the creation that we were created for. وَكَانَتْ تَفُوتُ الْحِكْمَةِ الَّتِي مُزِجَ لِأَجْلِهَا بَيْنَ الْخَيْرِ وَالشَّرِّ وَالْأَلَمِ وَلَذَّهِ وَالنَّافِعِ وَالضَّارِ He said, and the wisdom that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala causing the people to go through the good and the bad and the and pleasure and pain and that which is beneficial and that which is harmful would have been lost. وَإِنَّمَا يَكُونُ تَخْرِيسُ هَذَا he said, but this will only occur in another world that is not the world that we live in. Al Asl Thamin, the eighth thing, and Abtila al Mu'minin bi Ghalabiti Aduihim, Aduihim Lahum, wa Kaharihim, wa Kasarihim Lahum Ahyanan, Fihi Hekamun Adima, La Yalamuha ala Tafsiri illa Allahu Azza wa Jal. Is that the believer being tested with? His enemy having authority over him and defeating him and breaking him at some times that this test has tremendous aspects of wisdom that are not fully known to anyone in detail other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala فَمِنْهَا but from those things اِسْتِخْرَاجُ عُبُودِيَّتِهِمْ عُبُودِيَّتَهُمْ وَذُلَّهُمْ لِلَّهِ وَانْكِسَارُهُمْ لَهِ وَافْتِقَارَهُمْ إِلَيْهِ وَسُؤَالَهُمْ نَصْرَهُمْ عَلَىٰ عَدَائِهِمْ He said, from the aspects of wisdom, is that it causes, it brings out from the servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, عُبُودِيَّة And these certain aspects of worship for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that would not have existed without these things. وَذُلَّهُمْ لِلَّهِ And they become more humble for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they are broken in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَفْتِقَارَهُمْ إِلَيْهِ And they realize that they are in dire need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala And they ask Allah to help them over their enemies وَلَوْ كَانُوا دَائِمًا مَنْصُورِينَ قَاهِرِينَ غَالِبِينَ لَبَطِرُوا وَأَشِرُوا And if they were always victorious and always mighty and always supported and the way that they would like to be supported, La Batiru wa Ashiru, they would become pompous and so on and so forth. And conceited. Walau kanu da'iman, maqhurin, maghrubin, mansuran alayhim aduhum, lama qamat liddini qa'ima. He said, well, at the same time, if they were always defeated, and the enemy always had the upper hand over them, then the religion would never be established. وَلَا كَانَتْ لِلْحَقِّ دَوْلَةً And there will never be an authority and a nation state that was establishing the truth. فَاقْتَدَتْ حِكْمَةُ أَحْكَمَ الْحَاكِمِينَ أَنْ صَرَّفَهُمْ بَيْنَ غَلَبَتِهِمْ تَارَةً وَكَوْنِهِ مَغْرُبِينَ تَارَةً He said, and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from His wisdom, He causes a situation to alternate that sometimes they are victorious and sometimes they are defeated. فَإِذَا غُلِبُوا تَضَرَّعُوا إِلَى رَبِّهِمْ you have to understand that in the time of Ibn Qayyim rahimullah ta'ala, the Muslims had been dealt crushing defeats by the Crusaders, town after town after town, city after city after city, and by the Mongol, the Tatar, town after town after town, Bukhara, Baghdad, and he, Samarqand, and he, millions of Muslims were killed by the Tatar right before the birth of Ibn Qayyim rahimullah ta'ala. And at the time of Ibn Qayyim rahimullah ta'ala, the Muslims were still fighting the Mongols, the Tatar. And the Crusaders had still taken Akka, they had ta taken the Bayt al-Maqdis, they had taken city after city after city. During the era of Ibn Qayyim and right before. And the scholars, they saw yani, that the threat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was true. That came from Allah to the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When the Prophet وسلم, he said in the hadith of Mustawrad al Qurashi, reported by Al Hakim and Ahmed and others, that is authentic. The Nabi وسلم, he said there are five things, and I seek Allah's refuge that you, that you should ever encounter. He said, Man ahad wa No people ever violate the ahad, the agreement, the contract between them 
the covenant between them and between Allah and His Messenger وسلم, What is the covenant between the believers and Allah and His Messenger وسلم, At Tawheed wa Sunnah huh? Worshipping Allah alone without partners Singling out Allah with His rights Meaning His names, His attributes, His actions and His right to be worshipped on account of those names, attributes and actions Right? They single out they single out Allah with his right to be worshipped and they worship him as he legislated to be worshipped, which is following the Sunnah of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So when people rejected the attributes of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and misinterpreted the attributes of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and started to worship other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and build mashahid and masajid over the graves of people that they called the allies of Allah and the saints and so on and so forth. And people started to innovate in the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and come up with deviant practices thinking that they were coming closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while they were coming for, while they were falling farther from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now what happened? Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, no people ever violate naqada ahdallahi wa ahda rasulihi illa Except that Allah will unleash against them an enemy, a foreign foe from outside of themselves. Because there are two types of enemies. When the Muslims are fighting one another, right? And when the Muslims are fighting, the kuffar. Allah will unleash against them, aduwan min siwa anfusihim. An enemy from outside of themselves, a foreign foe. Who will take some of what they possess, take some of their lands, take some of their possessions, take some of their children and wives as slaves and captives. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will unleash against them when they violate the contract of the contract of Allah and His Messenger. The covenant of Allah and His Messenger. Allah will unleash against them a foreign foe who will take some of what is in their hands. So this is the reality of the affair. And he, that the believer he understands. That the believer he understands that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes will, will give victory to the believers and sometimes he will give victory to the disbelievers. If they are defeated, they have to look at where they are with their religion. Where they are with their religion. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he said in the Quran, Allah will never lend. Allah will never make a way for the kuffar over the mu'mineen. Allah will never make a way for the kuffar over the mu'mineen. Ibn Qayyim, he said, some of the scholars of tafsir themselves didn't even understand this verse. And so what they said the verse meant is meaning in the hereafter. And some of them they said, alayhim sabila, that he will give them a sabil over them in a hujjah. And he meaning a way to argue and he in defense of falsehood to disprove the truth. Ibn Qayyim rahimullah ta'ala, he said that neither of these is what is meant by the verse. He said, but rather, as the principle states, Al-Hukmu yaduru ma'a illatihi wujudan wa adman wa quwwatan wa da'afa. That a ruling is coupled with the reasoning for the ruling. Here the ruling being the reward of Allah, the help of Allah, the assistance of Allah. That Allah will not give a wave to the disbelievers over the believers. This is the ruling. It is it is from the universal law of Allah, the way of Allah in dealing with His creation. It is from the rule of Allah, from the preordainments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? It is something that there is some there is a cause and there is an effect. This is the effect, it has to have a cause. What is the cause? Their iman. He won't give away to the kuffar over who? Over who? The believers. What is the quality of the believers? Belief. Iman. Iman, it does what? It increases and it decreases. Right? It increases and it decreases. The scholars, they say that a ruling, yaduru ma'ilatihi. Yani, it goes along with the reason for the ruling, the cause of the ruling. Wujudan wa adman. If the cause exists, then the ruling will exist. If the cause is absent entirely, then the ruling will be absent entirely. If the cause is strong, then the ruling, meaning the effect will be strong. And if it is weak, then the effect will be weak. 
And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ibn Qayyim rahimullah ta'ala, he said, said that he would never give away to the kuffar over the believers. He said, but in reality, when you find the kuffar have found a way over the believers, a way to get control over the affairs of the believers, they are the ones who gave them away. They are the ones who gave them away to have control and authority over their own selves. Allah didn't give them the way they gave the kuffar away over themselves. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from his wisdom tabaraka wa ta'ala and he tested them and he punished them in such a way. He said, فَإِذَا غُلِبُوا تَضَرَّعُوا إِلَى رَبِّهِمْ So what do they do when they are defeated? تَضَرَّعُوا إِلَى رَبِّهِمْ They turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with dua seeking the assistance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَأَنَابُوا إِلَيْهِ And they return back to obedience وَخَضَعُوا له. And they surrender to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَانْكَسَرُوا له. And they, and they humble themselves and show themselves in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be broken وَتَابُوا إِلَيْهِ and they repent to him subhanahu wa ta'ala and when they are victorious and they have the upper hand then in response to that they establish the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they establish the sha'air of Allah the outward manifestations of the religion of Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala wa amaru bil ma'roof wa nahu anil munkar and they order the good and they forbid the evil wa jahadu aduwah wa nasaru awliya'ah and they struggle against the enemies of Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala and they aid the allies of Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala wa minha likewise from the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in doing so annahum law kanu da'iman mansurin ghalibin qahirin la dakhala ma'ahum ما ليس قصد الدين ومتابعة الرسول فإنه إنما ينضاف إلا من له الغلبة والعزة He said likewise if they were always victorious if they always had the upper hand if they always had the authority then they would enter amongst their ranks those whose intention and whose ambition was not to follow the way of the messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم or the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but rather they only joined their ranks because they were victorious they want to be on the winning team they only joined their ranks to be with them because they were victorious and because they were honored and because they were powerful and so on and so forth but at the same time if they were always weak and downtrodden and so on and so forth no one would enter into Islam Right? No one would enter into Islam. He said, فَاقْتَضَتَ الْحِكْمَةُ الْإِلَهِيَّةِ أَنْ كَانَتْ لَهُمَ الدَّوْلَةُ تَارَةِ وَعَلَيْهِمْ تَارَةِ فَيَتَمَيَّزُ بِذَلِكَ بَيْنَ مَنْ يُرِيدُ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهِ وَمَا لَيْسَ لَهُمْ مُرَادٌ إِلَّا الدُّنْيَا وَالْجَاحِ He said, and so it is from the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the divine wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is sometimes they will have the authority and other times authority will be had over them so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can distinguish between their ranks those who want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and those that only want the dunya and influence وَمِنْهَا أَنَّهُ سُبْحَانَهُ يُحِبُّ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ تَكْمِيلَ عُبُدِيَّتِهِمْ عَلَى السَّرَّاءِ وَالضَّرَّاءِ وَفِي حَالَ الْعَافِيَةِ وَالْبَلَاءِ وَفِي حَالِ إِدَالَتِهِمْ وَالْإِدَالَةِ عَلَيْهِمْ He said likewise from the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves to complete the servitude of His worshippers as regards their worship and both the easy times and the difficult times and the time when they are spared from calamity and the time when they are afflicted and the time when they have authority and the time when authority is had over them فَلِلَّهِ سُبْحَانَهُ عَلَى الْعِبَادِ فِي كِلْتَ الْحَالَتَيْنْ عُبُودِيَّةٌ بِمُقْتَضَى تِلْكَ الْحَالِ and there is a way that they worship Allah in both situations in both situations when the Muslims are weak and the Muslims don't have the authority in the land and so on and so forth Shaykh al-Islam ibn al-Taymi rahimullah ta'ala he said then they go back to acting upon what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was instructed with when he was in Mecca as regards the da'wah which is teach the people call to the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be patient with the abuses of the kuffar the abuses of the munafiqeen so on and so forth to the end of it what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was advised with in Mecca and he to be patient with the harms of the kuffar and the likes of these affairs right and he went, the Prophet ﷺ, 
reached Al Madinah, he was able to do other things as regards offensive and defensive jihad. And the Muslims are in a situation now, as the Shaykh Uthaymin rahimullah ta'ala, he said the Muslims are in a situation now where they barely meet the conditions of defensive jihad, of being able to defend themselves from an invading foe, let alone going in, launching an offensive against anyone. But you find some of the Muslims, he said they are hamqa, hamqa. He said some of the Muslims, they are retarded. They don't have the ability to defend themselves and they go and they pick a fight with somebody that they cannot defend themselves from. It happened in Islamic history. There was a man, his name was Khawarizm Shah. There was a Iqlim, and he a small area of what is current day Afghanistan. Called Khawarizm Shah, meaning Malik. The king of Khawarizm, Khawarizm Shah, right? This is found in al Bida when he had in the books of history. Khawarizm Shah, Khawarizm Shah was the man that on one occasion, the on one occasion the emissaries or some tujar rather some merchants they were passing through they were passing through Khawarizm from the Tatar they were merchants they were from the Mongols from the Tatar right they were passing through Khawarizm the king of Khawarizm knowing how powerful the Mongols were so on and so forth plundered the caravan took everything and killed the merchants the Mongols didn't send an army. They sent what? What's the first step? You sent emissaries. You sent messengers. Right? And what don't you do in politics? You don't kill the messenger. Khawarizm Shah was smelling himself. Right? He just killed some of the merchants from the Mongols and he took their property. And then after that, what did he do? When they came to inquire, say, you know, it's a general principle. It's a principle in the Sharia. It's a principle logically. It says, Al hukmu ala shay an Before you reach a conclusion, you have to have the full details of what happened. So before they sent an army, because the Mongols weren't thinking about the Chinese. I mean, the Mongols weren't thinking about the Muslims. They were fighting the Chinese. The Mongols at that time, they had a beef. They had a problem with the Chinese. They were fighting the Chinese. The Chinese had oppressed them. They were in the steppe, they were the steppe people, so on and so forth. They had oppressed them for generations. They had built up an army, and they had uh, a cavalry, so on and so forth. They had skill in warfare, and so they were socking it to them, right? They were beating the, they were beating sparks out of the Chinese, right? They weren't thinking about the Muslims. Hulagu, who was the son of Genghis Khan, when he heard what happened, he said, well, that ain't right. I mean, why, why are they, plunder our wealth. I mean, don't, don't they know they're like kind of bad, you know what I'm saying? You can fight. You have an enormous army. The whole world is afraid of us. Why would they plunder our caravan? Let's send some messengers to them, right? Let's deal with this with some diplomacy. The messengers arrived, they decapitated them, sent their bodies back and crucified them at the borders or some crazy stuff like that, right? Hulagu was like, I'm going to adjust their belief system. <laughs> Adjust their belief system. They're going to wake up believing and we're about business. And so they entered the lands of the Muslims and they killed. They entered Bukhara, they killed nearly a million people. They entered Baghdad, killed nearly a million people. Right? Entered city after city after city. Who brought them there? Khawarizm Shah. Where did Khawarizm Shah go? To the same ca caves Bin Laden probably went to. In Afghanistan. In the mountains of Afghanistan, running from cave to cave, hiding from the Mongol army. SubhanAllah. How you pick a fight with somebody you can't beat? You can't defend the woman, you can't defend the children, you can't defend your borders, you can't defend your property, you can't defend your lands from some people, you want to pick a fight with them. There is a certain way that we worship Allah in the Halatul Quwa and Halatul Da'af. And when the Muslims have authority and they have leadership, and they have an army, and they have power, and they have influence, there's a certain way that they deal with the affairs, right? As regards war and peace and politics and these sorts of things and international relationships between nation states. And that's their responsibility, right? That's something that those things aren't even addressed to us. They are addressed to those things in the Quran as regards warfare and so on and so forth. They are addressed to the rulers of the Muslims and the commanders of their armies. Those people who have authority. And in a situation where the Muslims don't have strength, they don't have power, 
they act upon what was revealed in Mecca. They learn their religion, they teach their religion, they make dua, they take the means, the asbab of, of al quwwah they have a manhaj of da'wah that is built upon rectifying the society from the bottom on up. From the bottom on up, working upon ourselves, working upon our families, calling our families to Islam, teaching those that will listen to us, and so on and so forth. And so Ibn Qayyim rahimullah ta'ala, Ibn Qayyim rahimullah ta'ala, he said that, في كلت الحال الحالين عبودية بمقتضى تلك الحال Every circumstance, I need a circumstance where they are strong, the circumstance where they are weak. There is a way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is worshipped according to the circumstance. لا تحصل إلى بها And it cannot be God in the worship of Allah, cannot be facilitated and established except by worshipping Allah in that way. ولا يستقيم القلب بدونها And the only way for the heart to be upon righteousness is by following that way. كما لا تستقيم الأبدان إلا بالحر والبرد والجوع والعطش والعطش والنصب وأضدادها and both of these things must occur sometimes they are strong sometimes they are weak in order so that they can worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala according to their situation he said this is just like the situation of the body sometimes it must be hot sometimes it must be cold sometimes they may they must be thirsty sometimes they must be hungry sometimes they must go through some hardship and toil and so on and so forth and the opposite of these things of comfort and so on and so forth for tilka al-mihanu wal baraya شَرْطٌ فِي حُصُولِ الْكَمَالِ الْإِنسَانِ وَالْإِسْتِقَامَةِ الْمَطْلُوبَةِ مِنْهِ And these tests that they go through are conditioned for the human being to reach human perfection and istiqama that is required from him. وَوُجُودِ الْمَلْزُومِ بِدُونِ لَازِمِهِ مُمْتَنِعِ And these things cannot be gotten except by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala testing the believers in such a way. And then this is just some of what was mentioned by Ibn Qayyim rahimullah ta'ala. And quickly, just mention the ninth, tenth, and eleventh thing. The ninth thing he said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the universe and life and death and beautified the earth and all that is upon it for the reason of testing his servants. For the reason of, of testing his servants, and he, so that it will be known. Who, the, yani who are those who desire what is with Allah and who are those who desire yani this world and the beautification of this world. It's the ninth thing. The tenth thing, he said, which is that a human being is urban in nature. And it is unavoidable for him and he and he must live amongst people. When nasu lahum iradat wa tasawwurat wa itiqadat. And then people they have aspirations, they have perceptions, and they have beliefs. And the only way for unity to occur is if their aspirations are in the same vein. And their tasawwurat. And their understandings and perceptions of things are along the same lines. They're playing by the same rules. And it that and their beliefs are the same. He said, in order for him to be comfortable with them, and for them to be comfortable with him, he must agree with what they want, with their tasawwurat, and with their concepts. And ideas and he must agree with their beliefs he said if he disagrees with them they're going to mistreat him and abuse him and if he agrees with them and if he agrees with them while knowing that they're upon faucet and he goes along with what they want and he goes along with what they're talking about and the tasawwurat and what they think and their concepts their conceptualization and so on and so forth and he goes along with their beliefs then Allah will send punishment. He will punish him in a different way. And he meaning that if he disagrees with them, if he disagrees with them, they're going to mistreat him. And if he agrees with them, knowing that they are upon falsehood, and he does what? He compromises. You dahil, you jamil, 
He flatters them and he compromises with the kuffar, which is different than al-mudara. It is different than diplomacy, using wisdom. But he just flat out compromises, right? He flat out compromises his religion. He said, "Yahsuru al-adabu mi machin akhar." He said, "Then he will find that he will be harmed by them in a different way." He said, and so he must come in contact with the people and socialize and intermingle with the people that he is around. And either he will agree with them or he will disagree with them. He said, in agreeing with them, He said, if he agrees with them, then he will be hurting inside. And it will be torment for him if he is agreeing with falsehood. وفي المخالفة ألم وعذاب إذا لم يوافق أهواءهم واعتقاداتهم. And if he disagrees with them, then he will be hurting, and he will be punished by them in different ways for not agreeing with their beliefs and their desires. And there is no doubt Ibn Qayyim says that the pain of or the hardship of diff the, the hardship and difficulty of opposing them and alam al mukhalafati lahum fi batilihim ashalu wa aysar min al alam al murattab ala muwafaqatihim and there is no doubt that it is easy for him to go through whatever type of discomfort and pain or hardship or hurting he must go through by opposing them in their falsehood then the pain that he will go through by agreeing with them in their falsehood so this is a general principle And he gives an example, he said, imagine a person who is oppressing some other people. Or they are committing fahisha. Or bearing false testimony. Or they are aiding somebody in the haram. And they want you to go along with what they're doing. If you punk out, my words, not his. If you punk out and you say, that you agree with what they're doing, and you support what they're doing, somebody's doing something crazy, the police come, and they got gunned down in broad daylight. The police come, did you see what happened? I didn't see nothing, right? You didn't see nothing. Crimes being committed all around you, you don't know what's going on. You don't know anything, right? You don't know anything. And you're working with those people, cooperating with those people. And you think at the end of the day, it's gonna come out in favor for you by being on their side. I'm going to join their ranks, I'm going to be with them, I'm going to make them feel like I'm one of the team. Is that going to come out in the long run? Is that going to come out good for you or bad for you? Of course. It's a rhetorical question. He says, so this is the affair likewise as regards every type of bottle, every type of kufr, every type of bid'ah, anything that you can imagine. And a person compromising in his religion, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to humiliate that person. He said, وَالْغَالِبْ أَنُّهُمْ يُسَلَّتُونَ عَلَيْهِ And in the majority of instances, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will unleash those exact people against him. He will turn those people against him. He thought that by being hunky-dory with them, by being cozy, comfy with them, by being hush-bush with them, that everything was going to turn out and in a certain way in his favor and so on and so forth. When he compromised, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unleashed those people against him. فَيَنَالُهُ مِنَ الْأَلَمِ مِنْهُمْ أَضْعَافُ مَا نَالُهُ مِنَ لَبَّةِ أَوَّلًا بِمُوَافَقَتِهِمْ He said, and so he winds up hurting and in pain many times over what he thought he would have got of relief by agreeing with them. This is the tenth thing. The eleventh thing. أَنَا الْبَلَاءِ الَّذِي يُصِيبُ الْعَبْدِ فِي اللَّهِ لَا يَخْرُجُ عَنْ أَرْبَعَةِ أَقْسَامِ He said that the affliction that a person encounters for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he, when he is mistreated for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a person, and he mistreats him because he is being obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he said is always one of four things either he is being afflicted as regards his life. He may be killed or injured severely. Or 
as regards his wealth or as regards his honor or as regards his family and those that he loves. So a person will compromise and he because of something connected to their life, something connected to their wealth, something connected to their honor, something connected to their family, so on and so forth. And he said that the most severe of all of these things is his losing his life for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he explains that the person who was killed for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that his death is easier than any other death. His death is easier than any other death. You understand that? The death of the person who is killed for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and a person is killed for the sake of his religion, his death is easier than any other death. He says, so any other affair, as regards his wealth, as regards his honor, as regards his family, or anything of the sort, any that he is tested with for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is even easier than that. So if a person, because he is practicing his religion, and he is tested financially, is required for him to give for the sake of Allah to establish the truth. If he doesn't give, nobody's going to give. And he has the resources, if he was to withhold, and everybody like him was to withhold, the dawah would never move forward. So he's tested with his wealth. If he doesn't spend his wealth upon that, then just like in the last situation that we mentioned, those people were turned against him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would test him by him spending his wealth and that which will bring him no benefit in this world and hereafter. As regards compromising with his family, and he will be the same situation. And he doesn't, as regards his family, he doesn't want to be tested with his wife and his children by ordering the good and forbidding the evil, so on and so forth. And so he is sakit and he is quiet. And at the end of the day, and he, they end up turning against him. They end up turning against him anyways, and hating him anyways, and opposing him anyways. And he thought that by being silent, he would win their consent, and he would win their approval and their love, and he would be able to hold on to them. But by being quiet, he loses his family. He loses his children. They apostate. May Allah protect us. And he, his wife, and he, she disrespects him. All sorts of affairs. And he, as regards his wealth, he doesn't spend it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests him with his wealth in a different way. And as regards his honor, he's afraid that if he establishes his religion, that it's going to retract from his honor, it's going to take away some esteem or dignity from himself. Or the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, in the hadith of Abdullah ibn Busr, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, that when you find yourself amongst the people, 20 men, less than them or more than them, and you look into their faces, and you don't see a single one of them who is respected for the sake of Allah, then know that their religion has become weak. Know that their religion has become weak. And the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Nusirtu bi ra'b, masirat al-shahr that I have been aided with reverential fear and respect for the distance of a month journey. The ulama they said, And those that follow the way of the Prophet وسلم, according to the level of following the Prophet وسلم, will get a level of respect according to the following of the Sunnah of the Prophet Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymi rahimullah ta'ala mentioned this about the Quraba. He mentioned this about the strangers who live in the lands of the Kuffar. Those that live in the lands of the Kuffar, he said that they will find that the more they practice their religion, the happier they will be. And the Kuffar will honor them and respect them to a level that they don't honor and respect the Muslims who are not practicing their religion. We know in the Hadith with Jibril, Allah announces to Jibril that he loves so and so, so love him. And Jibril, he tells the inhabitants of the heaven, and then what happens? What is placed for him in the earth? Acceptance. So according to his following of the religion, acceptance is placed for him in the earth. Respect is placed for him in the earth. A person who thinks that the only way to retain their honor and their dignity is compromising their religion, and then they are sadly mistaken. The point is that a person they are tested, when they are tested for the sake of Allah, either with their life, or either with their property, or either with their honor and reputation, or either with their family. And the person who thinks that the only way to retain those things, any or any that the only way to get happiness, 
and it's the compromise as regards the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as regards those four things that are sadly mistaken. I apologize if I went a little long. We're trying to fill the time in between the lectures. I was supposed to go after Asr. I have an appointment after Asr. Hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Somebody asked a question, do this have anything to do with us? What does not concern us, we leave alone. Please elaborate or explain. Wallahi, I don't understand this question. Why I don't understand this question. Does this have anything to do with us? What we just spoke about, does it have anything to do with us? No, Imam. Ah. doesn't concern us and well, we leave alone. Most probably they might say uh, uh, they might see a, a, a situation uh -huh. and they might say that we leave alone, it doesn't concern us. So I'm asking the question, when we see an act that's being committed, is a Muslim or non-Muslim might be involved? Do we get involved or do we I mean in general there are there are guidelines for ordering the good and forbidding the evil. One is that it doesn't lead to a greater evil. Another is that the person who is being advised that they're going to benefit from your advice are actually likely to listen. They're likely to listen to your advice. To your advice. That's why in the statement of Allah, O oh, you believe, alaykum anfusakum. Worry about yourselves. Mu'adh ibn Jabal is reported in the uh, tafsir of At-Tabari. He said, advise man yaqbalu minkum. Advise those that you know will accept from you. Or like Allah said, وَذَكِّرْ and remind if the reminder benefits, if the reminder is going to benefit, right? So, I mean, it's according to the situation. It's according to the situation. You know, if you know somebody is being oppressed, for example, right? And because if a person is committing a munkar, it's one of two situations. Either it's hurting them, or either it's hurting somebody else. What they're doing is hurting them, or it's hurting somebody else. If it's hurting somebody else, and you have the ability to at least say something about it, you should say something about it. Or do something about it, you should do something about it. It's a hadith where the Prophet wasallam said a man was lashed. It was ordered that he be lashed a hundred times in his grave. Right? It's reported by Tahawi and Mushkal al-Athar. And authenticated by Shaykh al-Abani rahimahullah ta'ala. And he didn't stop asking Allah and pleading with Allah until Allah made it one lash. He said he was lashed by the angels one time and filled his grave with fire. When he regained consciousness, he said, Lima jalad tumuni, why did you lash me? He said, because on one occasion you made, you made salat biduni tahur, without tahara. Another occasion, marad tabi madlum falam tansur. Another occasion you were passing by a person who was being oppressed and you didn't help them. You were passing by a person who was being oppressed and you didn't help them. So if you know that your intervention in affair is not going to lead to a greater evil, it's not going to any bring about some type of physical harm for yourself or so on and so forth, right? Because in general, any of those affairs are for any from the ways that you can intervene in an evil, right? And if you see a bunch of kids slapping somebody around in the street, so on and so forth, right? And you know in a city like this that they may be Muslim kids, they may respect you as a Muslim, and they may be gang members, but they may be Muslims at the same time, right? And you stop and you say, hey man, leave that man alone. And you know it's not going to lead to them putting their hands on you. Then do that, right? But if you know that the only way to do something about it is to call the authorities, right? You call the police and you alert somebody to the fact somebody's going to beat up, slapped around, rob, so on and so forth, right? Depends on the situation that you go through, right? Now if you know that somebody is being oppressed and you have the ability to do something, you must do something. Right? According to your capability without bringing great harm to yourself. Right? And in a situation where a person is only harming their self, they're only harming their self, and then you see from the person, you look at the person's situation. If you know they're a person who doesn't take advice, they've been advised in the past, they don't take advice, and the scholars they say, and then there are many narrations to show that. Right? There's a narration of Abdullah bin Amr. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said about in the last times, he said, 
And you just worry about any your own family and the people close to you. And don't worry about the common people. Don't worry about the masses of the people because any advice doesn't benefit them, so on and so forth. And that's one situation. But you know people aren't going to take your advice. The scholars, they say you don't have to advise those people. If you know they're not going to take your advice. That's not just presuming that somebody's not going to take your advice. You know somebody's arrogant. You say something to them, they're going to blow it out of proportion. And he make it mean something it didn't mean, so on and so forth. I'm going to allow you some intelligence, right, with that. <coughs> but if you know that, they take your advice. And the scholars, they say, nasihatu marratan. You give advice twice. You give advice twice. They said, فَالْأُولَى لِلْدِّيَانَ وَالثَّانِيَةُ لِلْتَذْكِيرِ وَالثَّارِثَةُ إِنَّمَا هُوَ لِلْتَوْبِيخِ وَالتَّقْرِيعِ They say that you give advice twice. They say the first is to carry out the wajib, to carry out the obligation, right? It's, a, it's obligatory to order the good, forbid the evil. The second is to remind them of the first advice, to remind them maybe they forgot. They're still doing it, maybe they forgot. They said, and if you do it a third time, then you're picking a fight. scholars they call the aglu taat aglu taat and that's what's mentioned in the books of the salaf and he things that are iftiradi and they're theoretic they're theoretic things they're not things that any that that are really pertinent to the people in their exact situation you know what i'm saying they're not really pertinent to the people in their exact situation and so they're just asking for intellectual curiosity that's something different and that falls into the doorway of and he leaving off what doesn't concern you Falls on the door, leaving off, it doesn't concern you. Are there any circumstances where a layman can make takfir of somebody? For example, if you know a person and you advise them about the salat and they don't pray and they make fun of issues of the religion, so on and so forth. And this kind of as they say when we ask questions like this. Alhamdulillah, Ahlul Sunnah. And he are the most knowledgeable of the creation, the most merciful to the creation. And the issues of a takfir. The issues of a takfir in general are from Bab al Uqubat al Shariah. They are from the doorway of legislative punishments that are the responsibility of the Muslim rulers. And because there are ahkam that are connected with if a person is a kafir, so on and so forth. Right? So if the person dies, and you say, on one occasion I heard him making fun of something in the religion, we shouldn't pray over him, or he didn't pray, so on and so forth. That's something that happens a lot when people die. They say he wasn't praying anyways. How do you know he wasn't praying? How do you know he wasn't praying? And the scholars, they say in general, we have to look at the reasons why we ask the questions. We have to look at the reasons why we're asking the questions in general. And he asking is something, kufr is one thing. Asking about a particular person. And he, are they a kufar because they said this, they did that, so on and so forth. You find a lot of people, we have mental illnesses in our community. There are all sorts of different scenarios. And a person, and they, they could just be talking out the side of their neck. Maybe they didn't take their medicine today. You know what I mean? I mean these sorts of things are complicated. And they're from, as a brother said, and he, from the goodness of a person's Islam, is leaving alone what doesn't concern him. Right? Allah knows best. Inshallah, we'll take a break until Salat al Asr, after which our brother Abu Zainab Tawfiq will speak back. Allah Fiq. Bismillah, brothers, brothers. Inshallah. Um, Bismillah. What we're going to do now, Inshallah ta'ala, uh, as uh, the Imam says, we're going to take a break. And we're going to feed the brothers and the sisters now at this time. And uh, furthermore, keeping with the policy of Master Rachma, we'll feed the guests and the uh, elders first. So brothers and sisters, we're going to take this time. And uh, after Salatul Asr, then we'll have our brother uh, Taufiq.
Abu Zainab come up, inshallah ta'ala. And uh, we'd like to welcome our guests and say if there's anything we could do for you here, Master Rachma, uh, don't be hesitant to let one of the administration know and we'll try to do our best to make it happen, inshallah ta'ala. Zahma and Kai. So now we'll go back, you'll go back to the doors in the back, the multi-purpose room, where again, we'll feed the uh, guests and the elders first. The, sister, the same thing applies for the sisters, inshallah ta'ala. Zahma and Kai, barakallah, please.